So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Thank you Nada for speaking today. It's good to have you here. So Nada Buhindi transitioned to becoming a certified senior professional career coach because she discovered and unleashed her own awesome to learn that her North Star is helping clients who are burned out and new to Canada, like she was, to take their career to the next level. Thank you for speaking today, Nada, and good luck with your presentation. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm not able to uh, hear you speak, so if you have questions throughout, uh, just put them in the chat and I'll try to answer them. And um, yeah, um, later on, if we have time, um, I could either see you in the networking sessions or you can, um, yes, can I use the information on this presentation for areas like engineering? Yes, you totally can. You totally can. Okay, let me get started. So this presentation is about how to land a 100K plus job in tech. And if you are not an IT person, you can still use these strategies to go for those high paying salary positions. Um, and this is without fitting keywords in your resume, like in the old you know, um, process, or getting a ton of certifications and wasting money on those, or cold calling strangers, strangers on LinkedIn, because who wants to do that? That's totally not effective. My name is Nara Buhendi, and I'm a senior certified career coach. I'm also an agile coach, and I have been in tech for 15 years. So I totally understand your frustrations as a job seeker because I went through this myself uh, when I was a job seeker in IT for the past 15 years. All right, so we are introducing the six-figure salary formula. It is a scientifically proven marketing technique that gets interviews on your calendar and helps you land the 100K plus job you love. And the reason I say scientifically proven, because these are marketing strategies that marketers use that are already working and are backed with a lot of uh, studies. So in this presentation, you're going to discover six simple shifts to land a six-figure salary job faster than you thought without wasting a ton of money on certifications or having Canadian experience, because I, I keep hearing that myth a lot. Um, the key to getting noticed by hiring manager without trying to beat ATS, and I'm gonna go through the ATS myth very shortly. And I'll go over the single biggest mistake that prevents job seekers from converting an interview to an offer. Okay, so let me bust, first of all, the biggest myth about ATS. This is from Forbes. So, you know, this is scientific, this is backed up, right? Forbes is, is an authority. Um, and the myth about ATS is that it filters out candidates, which it deems unsuitable and deletes, deletes them automatically before they ever um, get seen by the human eye. So that is the biggest myth about how there are bots in the background and your resume never gets seen by a recruiter or the human eye. And because of that, we end up stuffing our resume into keywords and pulling our hair using um, scam apps that test whether our resume is ATS compliant. So I'm gonna bust this myth right now and let you guys know that this is all false. It is so not true. All right. So a little story, um, a story about one of my clients, just to protect her privacy. I'm gonna call her Sarah. So Sarah came to me because she got laid off due to COVID and she was jack of all trades. She had no idea what she wanted to do. Uh, she had project management experience. She had a lot of publishing experience, but I noticed that she was very passionate about agile. But she said to me that, hey, I do not have the title as an Agile coach, so I'm not going to be able to get an Agile coach job. And after going through the system and following it, she ended up landing a six-figure salary job, doing something that she absolutely loved without going through stuffing a whole bunch of keywords in her resume and using the old system that doesn't work of job searching. So there are two pitfalls when it comes to job search. The number one pitfall that job seekers make, and I used to make that mistake too, 
is the ideal job identification. There are three categories that job seekers fall into. One, they're completely confused and have no idea what they want to do. So here's an example, and these are actual, you know, LinkedIn profiles. Um, so in this example, the person said that she is client, she's a client-focused nerd who loves interacting with people. You notice that she's not really specific about the role, completely confused, just, you know, trying to figure out what she wants to do, but still applying for jobs. The second category is jack of all trades. This is where I notice job seekers saying, I, I want to be a product manager and I'm also a scrum master and I'm also a tester. And what you end up doing when you're not being super clear about the exact role is you don't get anything. And then the third category is the laser focus. This is the winning, this is the winning category. The person who is very clear on what their ideal job is and what they're good at. They know exactly what role they want to get. So third example, the person just markets themselves as a professional scrum master. The second pitfall that I see a lot is the lack of personalization and connection in people's profiles. Creating resumes that don't stand out, you know, going to an interview and sounding like a robot or a textbook, um, you know, can't communicate what makes you different and trouble getting hiring managers to like you because you're not treating this as an actual relationship when you go to an interview. People hire people they like. So that those are the two biggest pitfalls that I see um, you know, people making. And here's what happened with one of my clients is that she got an offer. And why did she get the offer? Because she really stood out. And that's the key, you gotta stand out, you gotta create that personalization and connection. Because the truth is, you don't need to spend a ton more money on certifications. Certifications are not gonna get you the job. You just need to brand yourself better and market yourself. And settling for lower paying jobs because you think that that's gonna get your foot in the door actually is a detriment to you. Because hiring managers are gonna wonder, why are they accepting a low salary? Maybe there's something wrong with them. It's like buying a product that's very valuable and it's marketed at a low price. You wonder, ooh, why is this valuable product marketed at such a cheap price? There's must, there must be something wrong with it. And then the other truth is that being qualified for the job, you may have all of the amazing skills, but if you don't convince employers, even if you have the, the, the most amazing skills, you're not gonna get the job. So you don't need a ton of money on certifications. You don't need to settle for low paying jobs. And just because you're qualified for a job does not necessarily mean you will get it if you're not able to convince employers and market them correctly, market yourself correctly. But if you can create a strong connection with your audience and get three calls a week for an interview, and help them understand the real value of working with you, they'll wanna pay you the 100K, the 120K, or even the 200K. Because think about it, wouldn't you wanna, wouldn't you pay a lot of money for a product that's gonna solve a pain for you? That's the same thing. And what happens is when you follow these techniques is your job search becomes a lot more fun. So let's dig into this six-figure salary formula. Here's a formula, okay? You can take a screenshot of this if you want. Um, one, identify your zone of genius. Two, create a captivating marketing campaign. Three, implement brand stories during interviews. Four, structure creates consistency. Five, don't be a hero, be a guide, and six, have a support system. So let's go through them all quickly. The first thing is identifying your zone of genius. You gotta know what your sweet spot is. This is a technique that is used by products. Um, you gotta know what you're good at. And zone of genius is the intersection of your interests, your natural talent, and you know, an opportunity where you're actually making money 
you know, because if, if you're not making money, then you're going to feel underappreciated. You're not going to feel valuable. It's really important to identify your zone of genius, because if you don't know yourself, what you're good at and what makes you different, that one role where you shine, how are you going to convince recruiters if you're not convinced? The only way you stand out is when you know what you want and appear as a unicorn. You won't get the job if you're not a fit and you really can't fake that. There's so much stretching you can do on your resume. And this is not something new because products do this. So think about Apple. Do they try to compete with Android on battery specs? It would be a joke if they tried doing that. But they know that their zone of genius is, is simplicity and creating beautiful interfaces and a beautiful user experience. And because they focus on their zone of genius and the customers who actually value this, they stand out in the market. But if they try to, tr to compete with Android, then no one would uh, <laughs> buy an iPhone based on the battery life, right? So products that focus on their zone of genius get sold and job seekers who focus on their zone of genius get offers. Remember that. Two, creating a captivating marketing campaign. So you've probably heard this. The recruiters don't spend a lot of time looking at a resume. It takes 60 seconds for them to, to just, you know, um, make a determination of whether they're going to read more or they're going to go on to the next one. And it's the same thing with ads. People don't spend a lot of time looking at ads, so they got to captivate within 60 seconds. Donald Miller, the CEO of StoryBrand, which is a marketing company, says, people do not buy the best products. They buy products that are communicated the clearest. There could be two products. One of them is more awesome than the other. Why, are, why would we buy the one that is less awesome only because it is clearly communicated to us and it plays with our emotions and we end up impulsively buying it? But the product that may be awesome and has an ad that is boring and not visually appealing, we're not going to be attracted to it. It's a human being thing. So creating a captivating marketing campaign and using the right wording, that's the winning formula for getting hiring managers to notice you. So think about it this way. Look at this ad, very boring, super wordy. Who's going to read it? Look at this resume, very boring, super wordy. <laughs> no one reads a resume full of keywords. Look at this beautiful ad. I'm looking at it. Life is easier on iPhone. And that starts as soon as you turn it on. Very little words, visually appealing. It draws me in. Now I'm going to want to buy this iPhone. Look at this resume. It's visually appealing. Look at the logos that show the organizations, you know, and, and it's very concise. Number three, implementing storytelling during interviews also known as brand stories in marketing. Do you remember the red bull gives you wings? There's a story behind it. That's why people remember it. So when it comes to interviews, implementing the storytelling to connect with audiences and pull at their heartstrings, it's important. Instead of trying to summarize your resume when someone asks you to the question, tell me about yourself, right? So it's very important to use the storytelling technique when it comes to interviews. And then also implement some kind of structure in the way that you answer your questions. If you're not structured and you're going to be all over your, the place, your messaging is not going to be focused. And if you're not scripting your answers, then you're not going to be able to deliver very well. Think about Obama. Do you think he wings his speeches? So you got to be structured and you got to follow a framework. And then the fifth thing is, and I see this a lot, don't try to be a hero when you go to an interview. You are there to guide the organization and solve their pain. You're not there to come across like you're awesome and you're amazing. Think Gald Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. What is the effect that Gandalf creates, right? 
to with for Frodo, for the guy that he guides. He creates, you know, calmness. He creates trust. And that's the vibe you want to bring into an organization is you got to be their guide. And instead of talking about your certifications, focus on listening. Focus on listening to the company's problems and how you're going to solve them. And then lastly, the sixth thing is you really need to surround yourself with a support system and like-minded people. Don't listen to all the noise and how, oh, you should take stuff out of your resume um, to increase your chances because you're overqualified. Oh, you don't have enough Canadian experience. Associate yourself with like-minded people and get yourself the right mentorship to get you from point A to point B. If you follow those six strategies, identifying your zone of genius, creating a captivating marketing campaign, implementing brand stories during interviews, um, creating structure, being a guide rather than a hero, and getting a support system, then you can flood your calendar with interviews for jobs you're excited about. And I'm not even kidding you about this because I have clients who are implementing this and they get an average of three interviews a week. The opportunities just come to them. Here's some examples. And one of my clients, I asked him, how are you finding these opportunities? And he's like, I'm not, they're just finding me. Because when you um, create that connection, people are going to get curious about you. So I hope that these tips were helpful. I'm always happy to have virtual uh, coffees with people. If you would like to learn more, if you want to review your strategy with me, I'm always happy to help out. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, just search for Nada Buhendi and you can just send me a message and say, hey, I want to have a virtual coffee. Let's chat. And I'm always happy to do that. So thank you so much. And um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Oh, um, I am confused about the resume to actually speak to your audience instead of regurgitating re jargon. I totally, totally feel you about the resume thing. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, there's a lot of confusion in terms of, oh, you know, it's not gonna be parsed properly, um, all of that stuff. So in the old days, they were using old ATS systems and they weren't good at parsing. But nowadays, you know, um, they're modernized and they can parse. And also, you got to stop relying solely on ATS. You got to just find a way to get your resume in front of a hiring manager. And when you do that, it, got, it, it has to stand out and look visually appealing. And when I, and jargon means you got to be concise in your messaging. No one wants to read a lot of stuff, you know, on your resume. Keep it, keep it concise, keep it short. I'm okay. Uh, keep resume short. Yes, you got to keep resume short, but it's also not just short, right? You got to make sure that your messaging is is also powerful. Think about all the captivating clickbaity ads that you see. Just you know, some some have you know short wording, but they may not be effective. Does concise equal one page? Not necessarily. So there's a common myth about how resumes need to be a one pager. That's actually not true. When a resume is a one pager, it's usually for people who are new grads. It doesn't give a um, professional image. People who are um, mid to senior level, below VP, your resume needs to be two pages. Yes, I totally understand about the confusion because everyone's giving different opinions about what to add or remove from my resume. Um, I, I, I invite you to have a virtual coffee with me and we can sort through your confusion. I went through the same thing, um, but I am giving you from a tech perspective. Um, I, you know, I've been in tech for 15 years. I was a job seeker myself. I was a hiring manager myself. And all of this information I'm giving you is insider information in terms of how the decision decisioning process works. 
Um, it seems a little counterintuitive for some people because we're used to seeing um, a lot of advice out there, um, but this is, this is what works. And this is why my clients' resumes stand out because they're different, they're written in a different way than um, what's out there and what's mass produced. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, let me drop my... The challenging thing too about you know tech is there are not a lot of resume writers who actually did the tech roles. Um, and this is something that I struggled with myself. Because when I was a job seeker and looking for tech roles um, and I would hire a career coach, they wouldn't understand any of the technical jargon or the agile jargon. And a lot of the important stuff was being taken out of my resume. So I totally feel you. Uh, so if less is more, has it to be more keywords oriented? Um, so I encourage you to research copywriting. Copywriting is a concept um, that is used to create content for websites. It is a different type of writing. It's more marketing oriented, right? So um, your writing style has to deliver a punch with very less words as possible. Think about Obama's speeches. They're very concise. He delivers, you know, he's trained to deliver a message in a short amount of time. So it's also about the quality of the wording that you're using, not just about less. Anyone have any other questions? My thoughts on cover letters. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, you know, most people don't really read cover letters, unfortunately. It's more of a checklist thing for recruiters and, um, and hiring managers just to see how serious you are about the job. And people, you know, pull their hair trying to write cover letters. And in the end, you know, the chances of, of it being read is, is um, very low. I have a very, um, you know, good guideline on how to write cover letters so that you don't have to create, you know, 10 different versions every time you apply. So if you want, um, <laughs> yeah, you spend hours. I used to spend hours writing cover letters too. <laughs> so if you want, send me a message on LinkedIn <laughs> and I can help you out. Um, I would always submit a cover letter just to show that you're, in, it's more to show that you're serious about the job than anything. Um, also, what about thank you letters after interview? Ooh, yeah, those are good. Um, just be careful that when you write the thank you letter, you're not trying to squeeze in any last minute, um, you know, stuff to prove that you're a fit for a job. Send it in a way where you're genuinely um, grateful for the opportunity. It's coming from, you know, a genuine place and you're just, flattering the uh, interviewer um, and focusing more on, you know, the personal connection. So if there is something that you connected on with the hiring manager, I would include it as part of the thank you note. In fact, the big mistake that people make in interviews is they don't spend enough time making small talk and trying to create that bond with the hiring manager. And the thing that you guys got to understand is people hire people they like. Think about even if you were to hire a contractor to do work in your house, or if you were to go and see a doctor, would you go to a doctor that is rude to you or, would, or a doctor that is kind of intimidating? Or would you rather see a doctor that makes you feel comfortable, right? In the, t I'm, I surely send my resume within the next 72 hours. Um, in the tech field, are the interviews more focused on the resume aspect or the code aspect? We gotta shift our thinking away from, you know, looking at our marketing collateral as documents and the interviews as a test or an evaluation of our skills. 
Um, when you get an interview, they already know that you're a fit for the job from a technical aspect. They're focusing more on determining whether you're a trustworthy person and whether you're going to fit into the organization's culture. So that is the reason the first part of the interview is very much behavioral based because they want to see if you're a decent person, um, if they like you, um, and then if you're authentic and the information that you provided is not fake. That's really the first part. Um, and then there is that technical interview aspect just to see your competence. But um, even with the technical aspect, and this is something that I actually um, got from a lot of my clients in terms of feedback, is they'll say that, you know, they told us that we our case study was really good and, and everything is good, but our delivery was not that great. Because you could be amazing at what you do, but remember that many of these roles, you have to work with clients or you have to work with team members. And if you are really good at your code, but you're not a very good um, communicator, then they're not going to hire you. So that's what the shift of thinking that I want you guys to make is um, really focus on creating, you know, um, you know, improving those soft skills and creating those connections with whoever it is that they're um, interviewing you. And think of it more as a conversation rather than a presentation or a test. I'm interested in thank you letter if employers reject application for the interview. I would like to keep the relationship between the company that I'm applying for. Just keep it short and sweet, man. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you guys an analogy. It's like if you were to go on a date and it doesn't work out. Are you going to force the person to change their mind? Once they've made up their mind and they don't want to go out with you, there's nothing you can do. So... The rejection could be for many reasons that you may not know about, and they're never going to be, you know, it's very rare that an employer is going to give you the true reason why they rejected you, um, mostly because they're scared of getting sued if they tell you the truth. They're not going to say, oh, I didn't like your voice, or I just didn't like the way you speak. They're not going to say that to you. They're either going to say, oh, they're going to give you the standard rejection email. Um, they're just going to try to be polite and just say, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll consider you for other opportunities. That's just a standard blanket, you know, answer that they give you. So my um, suggestion, if you want to keep it professional, and yeah, you don't want to burn bridges in case they do have an opportunity. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just say, just say uh, thank you. I'm very grateful. I respect your decision. That's it. Do not try to convince them. That's like for that's like <laughs> scary. It's like stalking someone after a date and saying, please, please, no, give me another chance. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yes, cringe. Any other questions? Two pages could be concise too. It's more about what re what is relevant and on point. Absolutely, absolutely. You can have an amazing two page resume. Um, you know, if if you're not cluttering it, and think of it like you know, maybe some of you are in design or UX. Um, think about you know the spacing. Think about where things are located. If you're trying not to jam everything into one page, and you're actually spreading it out into two pages. Um, and you have achievements that are clearly articulated and measurable, um, emphasizing the impact, not just what you did, that's really important on a resume. Does the LinkedIn need to, to match the resume? Do you change anything between them? So it's very important to create consistency between your LinkedIn and your resume. This is what happens often. The recruiter, gets your resume, they're going to do a background check on you, a social media background check on you. <laughs> so make sure that you're, you know, this, 
you just hide this, you know, take away the skeletons that are that are in front of, you know, people and just make sure that they're hidden. You know, if you, there's anything like pictures or whatever, make sure that they're not available. Instagram, make it private. Um, they're going to match up the LinkedIn to your resume. They're going to look that the t titles match and they're going to look that the dates match. So if you have a gap as well that's in your resume that's not reflected in your LinkedIn, that's going to create contradiction. In terms of the content within your LinkedIn, um, in terms of the um, descriptions, the bullet points and the descriptions in each position, those don't necessarily need to be lined up. But the titles and the dates, they got to be lined up. You can't have a mismatch. Could you elaborate on finding your zone of genius when you pivot from one industry to the other, say, for example, from manufacturing to technology? Yeah, so zone of genius is a very long conversation because I actually do a lot of assessments with people to go back from their childhood all the way to present to figure out some of the things that they're really good at. Because what happens is you know, the problem is in our childhood, we have all of these interests, but because we have either um, families who pressure us to, let's say, be a doctor or be an engineer or, um, you know, friends who tell us, oh, you know, you shouldn't be taking this program or you shouldn't be doing this job. We end up suppressing all of that stuff and we end up creating a lot of self-doubt that sort of clouds our mind and we get influenced and try to copy other people in terms of, oh, you know, there's all these jobs in the market. There's a lot of project management jobs. Let me apply for those. There's a lot of mindset stuff that goes on. Um, so what I do is I do a lot of exercises and assessments to look at people's um, skill sets, to look at their hobbies. Um, if you guys have seen or heard of Simon Sinek where he says, um, you know, figure out your why, right? This is part of what we're doing, but for a career. And then we end up looking at what's feasible. So yeah, you love all these things, but also we need to make sure that you don't need to go crazy and upskill um, in order to be um, a fit. Um, zone of your zone, your your uh, your zone of genius is very similar to a product's value proposition. If you Google value proposition, you'll understand that better. It's your differentiator, what makes you different. So I'll give you an example. I have a client who's a product manager, um, but he has a lot of data experience. So his zone of genius really is being a product manager, but within the data world. I have another client whose zone of genius is just having an amazing eye for design. So we figured out that it's got to be something related to UX that she should go into. Should I add experience that shows soft, soft skills like waitering or tutoring? Um, it really depends on, again, this is why it's important to identify your ideal job. If, you know, it's not relevant to your ideal job, then I would not include it. Um, you got to focus on the transferable skills and really highlighting them and making sure they're aligned to your ideal job. So let's say I'm a product um, and um, I am trying to um, get, like, let's say I'm an iPhone, right? And what is what, what pain am I solving for people? They need a way to communicate with their friends, right? So I'm not going to, as an iPhone, I'm not going to talk about things that have nothing to do with communication as part of my features. So think of it that way. Think of yourself as a product. Think about the problem you're solving for companies within that particular role. Um, and think about the, those skills, whether they're soft skills, um, whatever they are, how do they align to solving that problem? Why is it that when recruiters offer you job match at first on LinkedIn, looking at your profile and then they ghost you? Uh, you know, recruiters are not bad people, but think of it like real estate agents or, um, yeah, think of it as real estate agents. They have a lot of phone calls to make and they need to um, basically match opportunities. 
right? And they get a, a huge volume of people that they need to contact. So, um, and they also, they make their living out of creating those matches. So if I have a hundred people to call because I need to fill this role, am I gonna invest time calling the 10 people that I don't think are a fit or I'm gonna use that time to find replacements? That's how they think. They just don't have time to go back and, and, and let people know that, no, I can't, I can't, you know, help you. That's the unfortunate situation. They're just overloaded. So don't take it personally. Again, date analogy. <laughs> you got a whole bunch of messages on your OkCupid okay profile, especially for the women, right? Um, they just don't have the time to respond to every single one of them. They're going to respond to the ones that are a fit. Any thoughts on reference pages? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't really, I don't really, you know, ask candidates to submit them because they're going to ask them at the point where they're doing the background check. So, I mean, I don't think they hurt but usually companies are not going to go through the references until until they're you're actually at the offer stage that's when they'll go through the references so i wouldn't worry about them too much usually when your references are getting phone calls you know that you're getting the offer or you already got it they're not going to go through the trouble of calling people unless you know they're they're basically close to getting the offer or got it already no problem it's my pleasure and uh if you guys have more questions you know feel free to connect with me at any time i'm always happy to help people out and jump on these virtual coffees because I know how frustrating it is to look for a job. Um, as someone who has been in the tech space and an agile coach, I really love working with techies, you know, like me and uh, being of service. So don't be shy, you know, reach out, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message. Um, I'm always up for a virtual coffee. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to come back on and say thanks for your presentation. It was great. And also, I really enjoyed you know, seeing all the questions coming in. It was really awesome seeing all the engagement. Um, but yeah, thanks again. It was great having you speak. Um, and if anyone wants to attend our next career conference featuring another speaker, it's next week. It's the uh, Canadian Virtual Career Conference on January 27th. Um, so if you go to our main chat on the event, you should see a link for that there. Um, and thanks again for speaking. It was a great presentation. Amazing. Thanks, everyone. Ha enjoy the rest of your day. <sighs> Bye. All my information is on the, um, I left my link and uh, feel free to connect with me at any time. Thank you. Bye.